I didn't hear anybody. Good evening, Mount Vale. I like that a little bit better. Could we all rise for the reading of the word this evening? Where, where's, where's my little buddy at? Here he comes. Tonight's scripture will be coming out of Psalms 69, verse 34. It says, Let the heaven and the earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein. Everyone here had to move somehow to get here. So, since you moved, why not go ahead and praise him? He done gave his life for you, and all he asks is 10% and gives you 90. Out of everything that he gives you, he just wants 10% back, and you can have the rest. So, let's go ahead and praise him with the worship team since we done moved and it's what he wants us to do All right. give him a round of applause for that this evening thank you um, I didn't have any other announcements but please remember that we're going to add uh, one extra uh, thing to the uh, coffee and the word coming Wednesday we're going to add the Instagram I believe I'm saying that right Instagram uh, along with Facebook, I'm not very techno savvy with all the uh, media things out there. So if you kids or anybody else that's uh, out there, if you would tune in to uh, Word, uh, Coffee and Word Wednesday, you can uh, catch my buddy, Brother Philip, uh, and myself. Uh, you won't see me on there, but I'll be behind the camera pointing and making him laugh and uh, making him <laughs> kind of mess up every once in a while. Uh, Wednesday morning, 8 o'clock, uh, Instagram and on uh, Mount Vale's uh, Facebook page. Uh, I, I think we're, we're going to try to get uh, everybody that we can to uh, share and share alike on the uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook page to where we can get out there a little bit further. Uh, with that being said, are you all ready to hear Sister Buffy? Yeah. She's a lot better at this than I am. She, she can talk without stuttering and all this other stuff. But if you would, give her a round of applause, and then we're going to get, get to the music and everything. We're going to get uh, me out of the way, and I think a uh, better-looking fellow is back behind me here. Bro. Uh, uh, turn around here. <laughs> uh, I, I want to share something. Can I share something? Do you remember the word that was brought this morning about going out and sharing the word? I left here and I was in a great big hurry to get to the Father's Day. And I run across this fella at, at the gas station. And he let me in front of him. And I was dressed just like his brother. And he says, pray for me. And I pulled him over to the side instead of, of getting my gas. And I bent, bent down with him and, and I prayed and stood paying for gas. Three or four other folks joined in. Can we do that from now on instead of just walking away and pretending like we're going to pray for somebody? Can we take time out and actually stop and pray for them at that time? That's on my heart today. Can we just take time out for God and the people that actually want us to pray for. And with that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Thomas Stewart, the man that asked me to pray for, for reminding us that today is your day. And this, this prayer is for us to remember to take time out for you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we ask you to forgive us for not taking that time out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for all the fathers, but most of all, we thank you for your son. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our church, we thank you for our pastor, and we thank you for the opportunity to come back into your house. Through all this, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for you sending your Son. We thank you for all this through the blood of Christ. 
Amen and amen. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you roll a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power. Let me know there's wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Just a few of you. <laughs> How many know there's wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. How many's been washed in the blood? Come on. How many's been set free by the blood? Praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody out tonight. It is tonight. with Sunday night live. Amen. How many's ready for God to do something in the house? My, 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 my. I'm telling you, hey, it's a good-looking crowd. Hey, you know what? I, I like it. We say it all the time, and preachers are real good at it because we know and understand. If you come expecting, God to show up. Come on now. If you come not expecting, then you probably ain't going to get nothing. Come on now. I don't mean to be mean, but it's true. If you don't come expecting, if you just come in to go through the motions, if you just come in to, 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 to tip God, let's just put it that way. You come in, you put your hour and two hours in, you throw your little offering in the offering plate. I got news for you, you probably ain't going to get much. But if you come in expecting God to show up and you come in with Him on your mind and you come in with praise in your heart, you come in with thanksgiving in your hands, if you will, if you come up lifting holy hands and singing, I'm telling you, you, you got to get a hold of this tonight. If you're able to stand, stand with me just for a minute. Because I'm telling you right now, I didn't get ready. I didn't get all cleaned up. I didn't get all shaved up, showered up just to come in here and go through the motions. I did all that for one thing and one thing only, and that's to get into the presence of a living and mighty God that can fix all my problems, that can touch me, that can heal me, that can set me free, that can take this world that seems like it's in chaos and set it right back in order in a moment's notice. Amen. And if you come in for the same thing right now for the next few seconds, give him your best praise you've given him all day if you need a miracle you ought to tell him i need a miracle i come into your courts with thanksgiving and your gates with praise tonight if you need deliverance you ought to deliver it and pray into him say god give me deliverance in this place Woo! I, i'm telling you i come in here expecting him to be here my 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 my, my. Brother, brother Matt Shelton's coming. He don't know it. But let's remember that. He's going to receive our tithes and offering tonight. But the thing about this, continue to remember, come expecting God to do something. Sheriff, how many you got? He got $1. Now, here, here, here's y'all help him out. You know what it is? This is a good example. He, come ex he comes expecting every time he comes in here to get some KJs, not just one. 
He's looking for hundreds. He's looking for two hundreds. I don't want to preach tonight, but you got to think about it. I come in here looking for a hundredfold, a two hundredfold return. Come on. I didn't come in here just looking for just a little crumbs, if you will. I come in here looking for the power of God, the power of Pentecost to fall in this place. How many know we need a Holy Ghost revival in this house? How many know we need a Holy Ghost revival in the land? Woo, come on, brother. Um, I'm going to tell a little story kind of my background. Uh, when I first went to get a job, everything didn't work out right, and uh, I got, well, they closed down the restaurant that I was working at, and it was when I first started giving my tithes and offering, and uh, I prayed, and I said, God, if you'll just let me get one more job, if you'll let everything work out, then I'll give more than my 10% to you, and that same week, I got a phone call, and uh, I got a job at a different restaurant, and you know, ever since then, that kind of started my trust in God. And I knew that he was faithful to me, so I'd be faithful to him. So uh, every time that I get the chance, I like to bless people and, of course, give you tithes and give more than your 10%. Don't, don't try to be cheap on God. And he's got everything taken care of. And uh, just be a joyful giver. Don't be stuck up about it. Be like, oh, there goes all my money. I'm giving it to God. Be joyful and be glad and see what he can do with it. Well, God, I thank you, Father God, that you would teach us, God, to be joyful givers, Father God. Teach us, God, to love and give as you gave your son, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Mount Bell Church, a healing church for a hurting world. My name is Lisa Norton. On behalf of Pastor T.H. Farrell and the Mount Bell staff, we would like to welcome all guests and visitors. Please stop by the Connections desk for an exclusive welcome gift just for you. We are so excited to be back inside the church, worshiping together as a body of believers who love God, believes in reaching people, God's heart, and His purpose for our lives. Now, please check out these upcoming happenings. Every Wednesday, grab yourself some coffee and the Word of God and join Assistant Pastor Philip Ruth for the new weekly interactive Bible study on Facebook Live at 8 a.m. The Bible study will be in an open forum where you can interact, ask questions, and participate in the discussions. Again, that is every Wednesday at 8 a.m. on Facebook Live. Unashamed Children's Ministries will host What's Controlling You? Children's Revival on July the 9th, 10th, and 11th at 6 p.m. nightly. Prizes will be given away each night, and there will be a pizza party the last night. To purchase your t-shirts, hats, tumblers, or decals, check with the Connections desk. All of the proceeds for the sale of this merchandise will go toward the expenses for Mount Bell's second annual camp meeting, which will be held beginning the week of August the 9th. The lineup of guest speakers include Dr. Timothy Hill, Dr. William Butler, Pastor Tommy Bates, Bishop Douglas Small, Administrative Bishop Wayne Doherty, Pastor Teresa Arwood, and Bishop Mike Addison. To continue following what the Mount Bell is doing, you can like and follow us on social media or visit us on the web at mtbellcog.net or grab a church bulletin. Just remember, we're saving you a seat and until next time, God bless.
on, sing it now. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Great are you, Lord. Oh, great are you, Lord. Let's sing this again. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore.
more time. Come on, let's sing it unto him. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. If you believe he's great, give him a good hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's give him a good one tonight. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. Let's give all of our dads a good hand for being with us tonight. You know, I was thinking about this. As they were singing, Great Are You, Lord, my mind went to Luke chapter 15. And the religious folk, amen, they're the, all, the religious people are the ones always messed up church. And they started talking about Jesus. They said, This man receiveth sinners and eats with them. In essence, what they were saying, they were saying, He is not of the Father. That's what they were saying. And Jesus told them three quick stories real quick to tell them they didn't know anything about the Father. First thing he said about him was, he said, let me tell you about my daddy. He said, my daddy will leave the 90 and 9 and go get the one. I come by to tell somebody tonight that's running, amen, you can't run and he can't find you, amen. I want you to know he's looking for you tonight, amen. If you're watching by Facebook or you're sitting here listening to he's looking for you if you went astray and then he said he said let me tell you how much you don't know about my daddy he said i want you to understand he'll light up the whole place he told he told the, the story about the the coins amen and the one that was lost he said he lit up everything i want you to understand he was telling us of the attributes of our father and the last one he told was of the prodigal son and this is what he said he said every day that he was gone he was looking for him how, how do you know that pastor i know that because when he saw him afar off off, amen. It was not the custom of older men to run, but he pulled up his garments and he ran to his son. I want you to understand tonight we have a father. Come on, somebody that loves us tonight, amen. Oh, that's sweet. Come on. Somebody give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Amen. I missed you this morning. Amen. I was about my father's business, amen. And uh, But I appreciate your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Hey, tonight, we're very, very honored tonight to have a father in the faith that's here with us tonight. Amen. I'm very, very excited. I'm always excited to get to hear Pastor Youngblood come and preach. And I want you to understand, this ministry spans longer than my lifetime. This man's been preaching, and he's younger than I am. I don't know how to explain that, but it's just the truth. Amen. With my hand up. Amen. But I want you to know that this man has been a father in the faith to your pastor, because when I couldn't make it, I can sit down over at that little restaurant and sit and cry and talk to him. And he talked to me, amen. And I want you to know we don't have many of thought. That, uh, Paul said, though, you got 10,000 instructors. You can't believe the people I got to call me on the phone, amen, and try to tell me what I need to do, amen. I, I, a lot of people call me on the phone tell me what God's telling me. Here's what God said for me to tell you about your church. I'm saying, you know what? Hey, I don't, I don't reject it. I'm just waiting on God to say it to me, amen. But I want you to understand, tonight we have, for Sunday Night Live, a true father in the faith. Brother Sam Youngblood, will you help me make him welcome? We're so excited to have him and his wife. Amen. Amen. We're so proud to have them. good to be in the house of the Lord. I'd rather be here than in the best hospital in the world. Amen. It's good to see you and uh, just worship the Lord with us. Uh, I thought about uh, him talking about the old man running. I may have to designate some of you to watch out for me. My shouting days are almost over. I shout inside, but I can't hardly shout outside anymore. But what a joy it is to know that my name's recorded in the Word of God, in the book of life. Hallelujah. And that I'm a child of God on my way to heaven. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just remain standing for the reading of God's Word. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua, the fourth chapter. And I want to read the first seven verses. And I'll try to read them slow so you and I want you to get exactly what it says. When the whole nation of Israel had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, 
one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God unto the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children shall ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan River was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a, remo a memorial to the people of Israel forever. You may be seated if you like. God, we ask your blessing tonight upon this sermon. I pray, God, that somehow you anoint me, that I may minister to the people of this great church. Lord, we love you and thank you for all that you've done. One more time, I ask for that anointing that I may minister in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen and amen. The scene, if you will, is a very important scene. And the last few minutes, is a, it was the last few minutes before they entered into the promised land. In Egypt, they had been promised the promised land. All through the wanderings of 40 years in the wilderness, they had looked forward to this time when they would go to the promised land. They were just minutes before enter into the promised land. The excitement of that hour was indescribable. You can almost hear them uh, rejoicing. And for 40 years in the wilderness was ending. The 40 years of wandering and following the cloud and the pillar of fire was about to end. Disobedience had put them there and because they, and they recognized the fact that because they had been disobeyed God, they had to wander there. But God had not forsaken them. Do you realize that God doesn't forsake us when we begin to wander around and, and not do what he tells us to do? Even though they had failed God, God was still working with them. They had been fed with manna from heaven. Every uh, six days of the week, the manna fell. They had been led at night by a pillar of fire and by day a, a cloud. Their clothing and their shoes had not worn out. I can't imagine. I go through a pair of shoes about every six months. And, and But theirs had lasted 40 years, and their clothes on their back had lasted. And God had fought the battles for them over and over and over again. God had fought the battles for them. Now they made it to the Jordan River. They were just about to cross over. Now no one was wanting to go back to Egypt. No one was grumbling or complaining. No one was planning a rebellion. They had done that in the past, but now their heart's desire was about to take place. They were headed for the promised land. They were growing across the Jordan, and when they got on the other side, they would be in the land that God had promised them. God had said it, and he had done it. God had told him it would happen, but there's only one obstacle now that stands in their way. Jordan River, the Bible tells us, was at flood stage. It, it was uh, all out of the bank, and there were no bridges for them to cross. But God had given Joshua some spe specific instructions as to what to do. He said, now, when you get to Jordan River, here's what you're supposed to do. The priests are going to, four or five of the priests will bear the ark, and they will walk up to the Jordan River, and the very second and moment that they step into the water, the water will part, and they're to stand in the middle uh, of what was the Jordan River. The Ten Commandments that God had given them were in the ark as they applied. And so they applied in, in, in the promised land that they were going to go just like they had applied in, in the days before. Twelve other men were to be chosen, and Joshua did that, one from each tribe. They were prepared to carry out an order that we often forget. 
I've read it many times, and for a long time it didn't dawn on me what he was saying. I believe God wants us throughout our lifetime to make some kind of memorial and to make a uh, statue, if you please, of how God has been good to me. And I, every one of us that's been a Christian any length of time at all look back at times when God worked miracles in our life. How many of you can say, I've had a miracle work in my life? I remember the time I can take you to the place where God saved me by his wonderful grace. I remember the miracle. And so these 12 men were to get in the middle of the Jordan River, and as they was now dry, and so they were to pick up 12 stones and take them in, into the place that they would spend the night, which happened to be Gilgal, where they planned to spend the night. Then they were to pick up 12 stones at Gilgal and take them back to the river and back to the riverbed and to erect a monument there in the river where the ark had stopped. It was an act that was ordered by God. It was an act that it seemed foolish at the time, I suppose, to some of them. But, but they were to set up a memorial of what God had done. A moment and a memorial of remembrance to what God had done for them. How strange it is that we have almost neglected this thing. It's not in our minds. We've almost forgotten it. When we are reminded of it, we wonder somehow what does it mean? How many of you know that God doesn't do anything just haphazardly? That God has a plan in everything that he does. And I, before I finish this sermon, I, I hope that you'll remember this the rest of your life. Many times in the scripture, we're warned about living in the past. Living in the past does have its danger. He said, if after we take it up, hold of the plow, we look back, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. Forty years before they had left Egypt, forty years before they had, had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, this miracle was no great thing with God. It was something he could do easily, but it was a great thing for the Joshua and for the children of Israel. I hope the somehow explained that to you. As soon as the priest, sole of their feet, touched the Jordan River, it parted. And they walked halfway across the riverbed and stopped. For the space of 19 miles, it wasn't just some little 600 feet or 1,000 feet, 19 miles of the Jordan River dried up instantly. All the way up the stream to the little village that's known as Adam. The riverbed was dry. These four priests stood there while literally millions of Israelites crossed over the Jordan. Upstream, downstream, men, women, children, flocks, herds, push carts loaded with their possessions as they went. I don't know how long it took. But there was no fear. These millions of people must have taken several hours for them all to cross. The God had been so near to them who walked among them for 40 years had fulfilled his promise. Here was the promised land. No longer slaves in Egypt land. No longer bound as a, as a slave. They were. This was their country. God had given it to them. And as they crossed over it was the one God had promised Abraham years before that he would give them. Finally, the tribe of Gad and the half of the tribe of Manasseh crossed over with 40,000 armed individuals standing in the middle of the bar the well, dry bed now of the river was still the four priests standing there where God said stand. How many of you know you need to stand when God says stand? How many of you know you need to stay there regardless to the circumstances? Oh, hallelujah. Standing as long as God said to stand. They wasn't given in to weariness. I suppose the ark was kind of heavy. had the four, uh, 12, uh, well, 12 or 10 commandments there and other things in it. But there was no great thing with God. You see, God can deliver 
who he wants to. I said God can deliver who he wants to. Whatever your situation is, God can deliver you from that situation. Amen. God can do it where God can do it when he wants to. God can do it where he wants to. But this was a big day, not for God, but for Israel. And God wanted them to remember it. God wanted them to know what had been done. So everything comes to a stop. God puts an end to the scene like he wanted to. Twelve men, each one from each tribe, go back, pick up a stone, and take it to Gilgal. Then they pick up a stone and take it back to the riverbed. The priests were still standing there. Two monuments were built at this day. One visible and one invisible or will be invisible. One marks the spot where the miracle took place. The other marked the place where they spent their first night in the promised land. Only when it was finished did the priests carry the ark and move out of the riverbed. Soon there was a trickle of water. And before that, there was a river overflowing its banks. Somehow I've got to find the words to tell you how important this story is all and how important it is. To help you see why God wanted these monuments built, Gilgal became the place of operation and the base of their operation. Armies were sent out from Gilgal to conquer the rest of Canaan. That's very important. Every time these armies marched out, they marched by those 12 stones that were packed down and said, this is what God has promised us. Oh, hallelujah. They remembered that their nation existed because of a miracle. I want to tell you, every church that's a God-fearing church resist, uh, well, that, and resists the devil, every church that is that is there because of a miracle. This church is a miracle. The Cedar Hill's a miracle. Churches I've pastored all over this state are a miracle. God worked it out. God did what seemed to be an impossible situation. Amen. He worked a miracle. The last church I pastored before coming back home to Cedar Hill, I pastored in Maryville. My boys are here tonight, and they'll tell you. We were driving towards Townsend down that main road, and I saw a sign of a piece of property for sale. I said, that's what God's going to give us. That's where God wants me to build a church. I called the realtor. The realtor said, it's already sold. I've already got interest money on it. It sold for a million dollars. It was seven acres of it, flat, beautiful land, a million dollars. I said, you don't understand, sir. God promised me that I can build a church on that piece of property. He said, you've got to be crazy. I said, well, when that when it falls through and your million-dollar deal falls through, give me a call. About a week later, he called me and said, Preacher, I don't know what happened, but it fell through. They don't have it. I said, I won't take It's all right. Give the Lord a house. I said, uh, I, I want to tell you something else. God told me to pay $250,000 for it. He said, you got to be kidding. I said, according to the law, you have to go to the owners and tell the owner what I've offered. If they turn it down, then I'm out. But God's promised me that property. They called the owner up. The next morning, he called me back and said, preacher, it looks like to me you bought you some property. Amen. 
Amen. I'm telling you, every church that exists that's a God-fearing church is a miracle that God has placed in that. Oh, hallelujah. God put his hand on this Mount Vale church and said, this is where I want my people to worship me, and you have a miracle here. Hallelujah. But back to the story. Joshua's headquarters was close to that pile of stones. God had called him to leave and to lead Israel. Moses was dead. The full weight of leadership fell on him. He didn't know what to do. But God said, Joshua, this day will I magnify you in the eyes of the people. He wasn't going to be alone. Decisions weren't to be left up to him. God said, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Things wasn't going to be easy. The burden would get heavy. Many times he spent sleepless nights wondering and pleading with God to give him the answer. But Joshua had a pile of stones that reminded him of what God had done for them. Some of you got miracles somewhere. Some of you got a pile of stones somewhere that every time you go back, you said, this is what God did for me. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for that. God worked a miracle for them. Knowing Israel, as I think I do, they crossed over Jordan that day. 19 miles of them crossed over Jordan. But I believe they had a celebration that night. I believe they were so happy to be in the promised land that the, God had spoken, God had promised, God said they could be there, and now they're there. They were no longer slaves. God had led them, they had followed, and their first night is now being spent in the promised land. I believe a celebration was held. I know it would be. But I'm not real sure that Joshua stated celebration. I believe he walked away from the crowd back to those 12 stones, that memorial. God had used them that day. His leadership had been promised and proven. But God you see, when God used me, your pastor said I was his father in the Lord. We spent a lot of time talking. But when God uses me, most of the time it makes me not want to be shout and say, look what God did. But when God really uses me to touch somebody's life, to touch some church. I want to go off by myself and cry because I'm not worthy to be used. God forbid that any of us accept any of the glory that belongs to God. So maybe Joshua slipped away out of the cloud and out of the crowd and out of the celebration and makes his way to that pile of stones. Maybe he will. Maybe he feels like I do, felt unworthy that God used him. I'm not really sure you understand that. I'm sure your pastor does. I'm not sure you can grasp how important it was to Joshua. But Joshua stood there knowing that God had helped him. Time would call on him. The years would prove that he was God's man. But circumstances would arise when those who praised him on that night would lead a rebellion against him. He needed those 12 stones. He needed that memorial. But not only Joshua needed it, 
all of Israel needed it also. Gilgal becomes the place where every important decision at this time was made. They carried out the covenant of circumcision in Gilgal. They kept their first Passover in Gilgal. Saul was anointed their first king in Gilgal. All of these events took place near that pile of stone, the place that marked a miracle. Hey, Christian, this old man wants to give you a piece of advice. You don't forget, if you don't remember anything else I've said, you remember this. Don't get too far away from the place where the miracle in your life happened. Amen? Stay there. You see, your salvation was a miracle. <laughs> your baptism with the Holy Spirit was a miracle. Every time he healed you was a miracle. Every time he provided for you was a miracle. I remember my own calling to preach the gospel. Sounds good. It's smooth, easy sound. Call to preach. But the truth of the matter is, when a man is called to preach, the sovereign God, the creator of this universe, the God who gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come to earth crucified. That same God, for some reason, selected me and called me to preach. I don't know why. He called me to carry on the work that Jesus started. I was called to do what I could not do. I was called to be what I couldn't be. One day, I will stand before God and give an account of every sermon I've ever preached, every church I've ever pastored, give an account, every revival I ever held, every soul who sat under my ministry I'll give an account of it. I had the calling, but I needed something else. So God gave me stones to build a memorial to him. Things I could look back on. Things I could hold on to. To say, God, you did it then. You'll do it again. God, you took care of me then. You'll take care of me now. God, you fed me then. You'll feed me now. God, you answered prayer then. You'll do it again and again and again and again. <laughs> Prayers were answered. My needs were met in a very mere. Well, just a marvelous way. Healings occurred in my family. Miracles protected us from danger. I look back. At 80 years old, I look back at my ministry. I started, I preached my first sermon in, in 1960. That was 60 years ago. That's a long time. Brother, I've put up with church members for 60 years. You know what I'm talking about. But more than that, they put up with me for 60 years. My family ate food that was sent from heaven. It wasn't manna, but God sent it as sure as I'm here. Money was supplied. That's as much a miracle as Peter 
had when he took the money out of the fish's mouth. Calling wasn't hard. Called. I didn't be. I wasn't. I've never have doubted it. My calling isn't hard because God has been right beside me all of these 60 years. That's all I give him my hand. I piled up a memorial of stones. When the flood waters roared down the Jordan Valley, Joshua could say, There's 12 stones under that river. It was put there when God dried it up and we went over on dry ground. When his leadership was threatened, he would walk out by the main square and look at those 12 stones that came from the dry riverbed. It wasn't the first time he'd seen it happen. He had been there when they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Joshua knew God did it then, and he can do it again. He can do it now. This monument wasn't Joshua's ideal. Something his lieutenants may have suggested to him, no. God had ordered it. Listen to me. God had ordered it. God had said it. He wanted them to remember. A few years ago, there was a popular country music song that talking about Digging up stone bones. I don't dig up bones at night. I polish some stones. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. God dried up the River Jordan for 19 miles. Years later, two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, are living at Gilgal. Years later, well, God took Elijah home, and Elisha came back. What would you do in Elijah's place? Uh, he went from Gilgal and Stones. He goes to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho. And then from Jericho, he crosses across the river. This may have been the first time that the monument in the middle of the river had been seen because Elijah cast his mantle on the river and it parted. I, I, I just, the Bible doesn't say it, but I just can't somehow believe it parted at that place where that monument was. And he walked over, got on the other side, and the whirlwind caught him up. Elijah looked back at him, saw him go up, he got his mantle, hold of his mantle, he came back to that same Jordan River, and he said, Oh, the God of Israel, and he throwed a cast of mantle on it, and it opened up again, and he walked past that river. Down through the years, every once in a while, I'll take a notion, I'll get in my car, and I'll go back to some of the places. It started when I was just a little boy. My dad had given up his job in the cotton mill. He was a foreman and gone into evangelistic work. He took his last few dollars, bought a little travel trailer, and we parked it behind the Anniston, Alabama Church of God. They were kind enough to let us plug in their electricity. It was just a little small trailer. I remember it barely, but I can remember one thing that happened. I picked up a stone there as a little boy and begun my memorial to God. That night, it was one of those trailers that you had to turn the table upside down to make a bed for the kids and had a mattress on the, on the under each side. But when you turned it upside down, it was so small, it blocked the front door. Locked the own entrance. That night they turned it up, fixed my bed, 
just before I went to bed, I said, God, bless mom and daddy and grandpa and grandma. Bless my dog, Teddy. And I started to get up. I was four years old. And I said, oh, yes, God. Would you send me some eggs for breakfast in the morning? And I went to bed. My dad said tears came in his eyes. And he said to his wife, before Sammy gets up in the morning, I'm going to go borrow enough money to buy him some eggs. Somehow I'll get it. But guess what? Knock on the door early the next morning. I remember because I was still asleep, they had to wake me up, take the bed up so they could open the door. And this old farmer said, Preacher, I've been down on the farm this morning, and I brought you some eggs. But he said, I also put a couple of slabs of country ham. If God will send a four-year-old boy country ham and eggs, I want to tell you we've got nothing whatsoever to worry about. Oh, hallelujah. He will do it again and again and again and again and again. My dad went to BTS. I picked up a stone at that little trailer, and I've carried it. I made a memorial of it. My dad went to BTS while there. They asked him to go to Teleco Plains. Some of you know where that's at. Pastor of the church. We moved into a little, well, for lack of a better word, a tar paper shack. It had two rooms. That's all it had. Outside that tar paper shack was old hand dug well. They dug down about 15 feet, and then they hit a solid rock. They burst through that rock and dug another 15 foot, and water began to come up right up to the edge of that rock. That was our drinking water. About, I was four, maybe five. My little brother, three years younger than mine, fell in that well. I remember saying, Mama, where's Doug? She had had it wa been washing that day and left the top of the lid off. She looked down in the well, and it was churning like he had dropped a big rock in it. She said, Lord, help me. And she jumped in that well. When she got to the water, she said it felt like someone just guided her feet. On one side of that rock, her foot landed, and on the other side, the foot landed. And just about the time she got settled, she saw a little hand come up, and it knocked the breath out of my brother, and he reached, guided, and saved his life. They went down to the road, flagged down an old log truck, this guy, he, he was a typical mountain man. He didn't have on any shoes, and he had on a pair of overalls with one gallus is all it was fastened together. Didn't have on a shirt. He brought some ropes, and they pulled my mom and brother up. He said to him, Ma'am, you sure are lucky your feet hit on that rock. Mama said, My feet was on the rock before I ever jumped. I picked up another stone there. God will take care of his people. God will see us through whatever this is going on. Whatever happens, God's not going to forsake us, but he's going to take care of us. I picked up another stone. Down through the years, I picked up stones. I guess I've got 12 or more. Things that I remember that God, what I'm trying to tell you this, God did it then, and he'll do it again. I'm sure I could pile up 12 stones of remembrance. 
that soon the Lord will take me on to heaven. And I wanted you to know there's a pile of stones piled up as a memorial to what God has done for me. And it's for each one of you. I want to tell you one more time. God is a God of miracles. God is a God that loves us. The next time God separates the Jordan River for you, pick up a stone and build a memorial of it. Pick up that rock, polish it, set it up so you can look back at it and say, look what God has done for me. There used to be an old song that we sung that said, look what God has done. I want to tell you, every one of you have the stories that God miraculously took care of you. One more, and I'll close. I was pastoring my second church. I pastored one church in Kentucky and then moved back to Tennessee. I pastored Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, between Columbia and Larsburg. One Sunday morning, I got up. We got ready. The kids got ready. Ruth said, honey, be sure you get your check because there's not any food at all in the house. I fed the kids the last little bit we got for breakfast. And I said, well, don't worry about it. God will take care of us. I've never gone to a clerk and said, give me my check. I've never pastored a church where I asked how much they paid. I think if you do that, you're a hireling. Amen. I didn't do it for the money. I do it because God placed his calling on my life. For some reason that morning, the clerk didn't give me my check. I went home. Ruth said, did you get any money this morning? I said, no. She said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know, but God has never forsaken us, and he's not going to now. She said, well, I'll set the table, but there's no food. But just about that time, there was a knock on my front door. And my next door neighbor said, Brother Youngblood, have you had dinner yet? I said, no, we haven't, but I'm about to. She said, well, would you come over to my house? I've cooked so much stuff. We never will eat it all. Would you like to come over and eat? I want to tell you that I picked up another stone. God takes care of his own. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I could go on and on. But let me just one more time tell you. If God opens up the River Jordan for you, pick up a stone and make a memorial to God. He works it. He deserves it. All through my ministry, he's taken care of us. All through my ministry, I've picked up stones. How about you? Have you got some stones in your life? Things that God did for you? How many of you can just lift your hand and say, Brother Youngblood, I remember the time when God saved my soul. Look where he brought you from. What he's done for you. Look at the many times he supplied your needs. The times he gave you a job. The times he put food on your table. The times he put shoes on your feet. Thank God. God is a good God. And he'll take care of you. I listen to some people when they talk about all the bad things that are going on. And I'm the first to tell you, I don't understand what's happening in our country. I don't understand what's going on. I love this country. 
And I love our flag and I love our way of life. I don't understand people who burn and try to destroy what we have. But I know this. I read in the book, don't worry what the men do to you, for I'll take care of you and I'll see you through. I'll be your God and you can be my people. Build a memorial to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I preach what you laid on my heart to say to these people. I thank you, Lord, for the years you have spent, the time after time after time, that you worked a miracle over and over and over again. You said you loved me. You proved you loved me. Thank you, Lord, most of all for salvation for calling me into this blessed gospel message. Lord, I love you with all my heart. I ask you to touch now. If there's one person in this building that don't know the joy of entering into the promised land, if there's one person in this building that don't know you, would you just somehow touch that heart? I preach what you laid on me. God, would you somehow touch them and let them know that you love them. If you're here this evening, I would listen to your worship. I love the way you worship God. I listen to you as you sing. But there may be somebody here that don't know the joy, that don't know that peace that passes all understanding, that doesn't realize how much God really loves you. I invite you, if you've got a problem, if you'll just come to the altar, let this blessed church pray for you. Would you just come at this time if there's anyone? Let's stand together. Would you just step out of your seat and come down to the altar and let God make the difference? Thank you so much, Pastor, for giving me the opportunity to come and minister to your people. I love God. I know for a fact that you are the apple of God's eye. I know that God loves you. Pastor Gail, would you just bow your heads one more time? Bless us, O oh Lord. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Help us to remember what you've done for us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. As your heads are bowed just for a moment, my mind goes back to this year. We were there, uh, me, Brother Philip, my wives. We were there, and one of the guides pointed out and said the water didn't just didn't just back up; it stood up. 19 miles and God made a miracle happen that day and I believe God sent this message tonight to somebody who's already had a miracle and you need to be encouraged to believe God will do it again what God has done children of God he will do again that, that's why my mind went here and I surely can't preach this man of God's message but my mind went here that's why Peter said, ye are lively stones. Amen? And, and he, you know what he said? He said, you are living testimonies of the power of Almighty God in the earth. See, they don't, they don't pile up stones now. 
but we are living testimonies that God is still moving in the earth. And I, I, I'm not even going to attempt. All I want to do is just, I want to invite you to come tonight. Amen. If you need a miracle in your life, can I just tell you this right here? You need to come and, and you need to let Brother Youngblood lay his hands on you. You got 60 years of ministry compiled into one moment. You know what a, you know what a miracle does? If, if, if you have a broken arm or a broken leg and somebody prays for you, in the natural, it takes six to eight weeks for that to heal. But what the anointing of God does compiles six to eight weeks of time in one moment and brings healing in that body. Amen. And what we have here tonight is 60 years of miracles, of ministry, of the moving of the Holy Ghost. And he's here with us tonight. He's a gift from the Lord in this house tonight. I believe that. I, my heart has been so touched by this message tonight. And I want to open this altar for somebody who needs a miracle. Would you come? Somebody, somebody, I'm not talking about a headache. We'll pray for your headache, but I'm talking about somebody that needs God desperately to move in a situation right now. Would you come? Right now is your time. Would you come? Brother Young Bud, will you, will you come? Will some of our brothers come right here? I want you to lay your hands on my brother. And we're going to pray with you. Would you come? Would you come? Let this man of God lay his hands on you. This is 60 years of the miracles of God. You made a Don't way miss this moment. When there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there. Your faithfulness, faithfulness. 
I'm still sin. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hand. This is my confidence. You never fail me. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hand. We appreciate his word tonight. He did a tremendous job. I love it when a minister gets up here and follows God and what he wants him to do. Let's all stand as we dismiss tonight. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in your house tonight, the miracles that you have performed. Lord, be with us as we go this week. And as we go to our jobs and in, in the homes, Lord, be with us each and every step that we take. And until the next appointed time, Lord, bring us back into your house. And it's in the blessed name of Jesus we ask these things. And the church said, Amen. Amen.